Oh, thank you so much to both of you for this wonderful thing. Before we go to Luke 15, I just noticed in the corner of my eye that Amanda, one of our missionaries, is back from Central Africa, and she's going to be here for a while. Uh, can you guys just stand up for a second? I know it's like, you know, a small church. So, hey, this is Amanda. Uh, before you sit down, before you sit down, she's here for a while. Invite her out for a tea, coffee. Let her tell you what she's doing over there, how the ministry is going. Just encourage her. She's, like, we pray for her regularly here in flesh, right here. So, Make sure, like, make her feel the love from her home church. Oh, so good to see you, Amanda. Welcome home. Just for a season, right? You're going to go back? Yeah, okay, cool. All right. Whew, that's exciting. Uh, Luke 15 is going to be exciting as well, I hope. So if you have your Bibles, flip with me to, open with me to Luke 15. It's always a privilege for me to stand here and open God's Word with you and look into it and asking God to shape us, to make us more and more like Him, appreciate what He's done understand more of who we are as well before and in him. Uh, so let me just pray before we begin. Father, I ask that by your Holy Spirit you would be at work in our lives for our willingness to hear and receive your word, uh, for the shaping of our hearts, for transformation so that as we come to rest in you and enjoy the depths of the grace you have for us, we would walk in such ways so as to show to people around us the heart of compassion that you have for us and for all that need salvation. I pray those things in Christ's name. Amen. So last week, Adam has kind of begun this series by opening the Good Samaritan parable with us, looking at how Christ is actually the one, if you remember the story, who finds us on the road, who heals our wounds, who stands in our place and then he calls us as we come to taste his grace he calls us to do likewise to resemble him in the world in which we live uh, and today we're going to be looking at chapter 15 the entire chapter so that's quite a chunk to go through but those three parables are spoken all together are spoken uh, as a response to a challenge that religious leaders would pose to Jesus quite often and so in chapter 15, I'll read and we'll stop here and there and talk a little bit to bridge the context into our lives. Verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. In the previous chapter, if you just scan, you don't have to read the whole thing, uh, but you can just scan. In the previous chapter, Jesus explained a lot about the cost of following after him. And in that, he's inviting people uh, rather in an unusual way, people who others would consider unworthy, others would consider uh, just on the outskirts, the outcasts, the sinners. He's inviting them to come into the kingdom of God. He would heal at the beginning of chapter. He would heal those uh, on whom others look down. He would challenge just the next few verses, those who would think on themselves of more important than others. Uh, he would include the outcasts in the invitation to the banquet of the kingdom of God, while excluding those who would be thought of as upright. And his invitation, though, like he was not to some kind of easy believism, believism or some inconsequential decision you know, to follow after him. His invitation, as you read through chapter 14, is to treasuring God above anyone else. Treasuring him most of all above your own father, your own mother, your own wife, your own children to a daily life, daily laying down of my life before him, denying my self-will and seeking his will to be lived out through my life. And that's why in verse 27 he says, you know, pick up your cross and follow me. That is hardly a leisurely call, unchallenging call. And so he makes it clear as he issues this call to count the cost, like you would building a tower, like you would going out to war. But in all of that, chapter 14, verse 33, make no mistake about it, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Like these are hard words and he finishes all saying at the very end of the chapter he who has ears let him hear these are hard words and as people are hearing those words those difficult words all sinners and tax collectors are drawing near to him that is like counterintuitive isn't it 
That's counterintuitive because who, who wants to hear that like today? Who wants to hear this call to laying down all of your life completely, your passions, desires, your hopes and dreams, laying down before God and saying, God, take my life and do whatever you want with it. I am yours completely as he calls you to follow after him. Who wants to hear that? I'm not saying you know, on the Parliament Hill or in your workplaces or in the public square or on the cities or in the university, whatever. Who wants to hear his call right here? Like among us. You know, like, let, me take, let me take notes. Okay, die to self, right? Subjugate all that I am for your purposes. Use my money, my skill, my energy, hours in my day for the sake of your kingdom. Live, breathe, walk, talk to the praise of your glory. Renounce all so I can be yours. That is a hard call. But someone who has come to taste the grace of God in their lives. Someone who comes to understand how, understand how lost and far and condemned they were. And Jesus came in to take them to himself, gave them life. Someone who sees the grace of God, sees that those words, though hard on the service, are actually an invitation to the fullness of life. And they lay down. The lie before him. And the tax collector and sinners in chapter 15, hearing the words and seeing Jesus filled with compassion towards them, right? On some level, understand that he calls them to life. Tax collectors, they were were just hated by all. They were those profiting by oppression of their own nation, enjoying easy, affluent, carefree lives. Sinners, those visibly so, and those maybe not so visibly, but, you know, crippled, lame, and afflicted in different ways. God surely judged them for some kind of hidden sin. At least that's what the religious people thought. These all are drawing to hear of grace, hearing invitation. In verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. He welcomes them. You know, he affirms their worth. He wants them. He should rather distance himself from these people, distance himself from their sins. Verse 3, so he told them this parable. Now, this is a very important verse because right here it marks for us who it is that Jesus is actually speaking these words to. It says, the them in this verse stands for the Pharisees and the scribes. He wants for them to have ears to hear. He wants for them to see the grace of God. He wants for them to understand that though they think themselves to be so close to God, they're actually lost. They're actually far away from him because their lives do not resemble who their father, they claim to be their father, is. And so he tells them this parable, verse 4, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Here's the thing. Jesus desires. He desires for the upright, the ones who are regarded as moral, the righteous ones. He desires for them to see their needs. And find grace. <clears throat> he desires for them to find life. And by showcasing, showcasing to them the lavish, searching, joyful grace of God, yearning for those who are lost to be found, he wants them to understand that their hearts are far from God's heart, and so they are lost. They need salvation. They would rather Jesus kept clear of these people while he shows grace to them. Jesus would rather go find one that is lost than stay with the 99 righteous ones. 
He would rather rejoice over one sinner who repents than affirm 99 of those who do not see their need for salvation. I mean, these words are meant to awaken them. This is this massive grace of God extended to those who go astray. It should fill them with joy, but they begrudge it. They're offended by it. And that betrays them. They are just as the sinners they despise, just like them. They're lost. And Jesus comes seeking for them. Verse 8, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, like the, the value of the coin is irrelevant here. It doesn't matter if it's a dowry or if it's their, you know, daily living. It doesn't matter what it is. What it matters is it's precious to her. And she's willing to turn the whole house upside down just to find the missing precious coin. And that's the point, that God is willing to turn the world upside down to go look for the one that is lost. That he's willing to defy the norms, that he's willing to humble himself, that he's willing to step into shame, that he, the glorious one, is willing to offer himself, his life, so that those who are lost are found. And it's joy. And it's joy when one who was lost is found. Now, just so we don't miss it, in both parables, it is the one who repents, right, that comes to see and taste the goodness of God, sees their need for it. That's the one that is found. That's verse 7. Just, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99. And that's verse 10. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And in describing God's desire and passion to save the lost, looking at the Pharisees and scribes, he calls them to see the need. He calls them to see that they need grace. Because for all their goodness, for all their uprightness, their high honor in society, and many religious practices, they are lost. They do not belong to the Father because they do not resemble Him. They are lost. They're seeking to merit God's grace, somehow merit His acceptance, His favor, as if we could do that. As if, if anyone could do that. And he said, verse 11, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I suppose the religious crowds will be quite in tune with what Jesus has said thus far. What the younger son has done was absolutely despicable. Asking for inheritance would be shameful to his father. It was a rejection of his love and care, implying that he wished him dead. Their reckless living would be shameful to that son, self-indulgent and sinful. The lowering to be a servant of a Gentile would be a disgrace. Jewish people were the chosen ones to be blessed, not to be willingly serving the Gentiles. And the whole pig matter, how low can you fall? Jews would never do such a thing. Serves him right. Serves him right. He made his bed. Let him sleep in it. May he suffer the disgrace he brought to his house and to his people. I mean, they'll be quite pleased to see the famine and the misery because surely that'll be a sign of God's judgment on this young person. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many 
of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, you know. Like, good luck. There's no way, no way this is going to work. Like, the shame the kid has brought to his father, who's going to cover for that? The shame he's brought on his family, not to mention the inheritance he squandered. Like, he's not welcome. Like those sinners, like those tax collectors, they had their chance. They chose their path, but now they have to live out the consequences of their choices. But God is unlike men. He's unlike us. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The Jewish religious people had a saying, there is joy before God when one who provokes him perishes from this world. But God's ways are not man's ways. God's thoughts are not man's thoughts. As higher as heaven is above the earth, so much higher are his ways, his thoughts, his compassion, his love. He sees a person smeared in sin and he burns with compassion. He burns with compassion. There is an indignation, all right, but it's against what sin does to the one he loves. And the son, as he comes to himself or comes to his senses, I mean, my father was so good to me. How could I be so foolish? How could I exchange his care and love for that which I thought would bring me life but only wither it away? I will go back. Maybe, maybe if I'm going to put my nose down to the ground and work hard, maybe he will take me in. Maybe as a servant. And the father runs to meet him. He runs to meet him and embraces him and kisses him in joy. God rejoices over one who turns back to him. He embraces her, he kisses him, and he comes in tenderness and love. Listen, you are never, never too far away from the grace of God. He is like a shepherd who would go out and look for you until he finds you. He is like that woman who's going to turn everything upside down just to find the lost one. He is like the father who would run, run to meet his son who's coming back to him. You're never too far from God's Grace, he, filled with compassion, kisses the one who reeks like pigs. Like, do you see the, do you see the prodigious, massive grace of God poured out to those who would think maybe they could merit it? Poured out to those who are undeserving. Poured out to those who rightly have no foot to stand on before him. He runs. If you have not come to him, turn to him. Turn to him. Your sin only withers your life away. In the Father's house, there is forgiveness. There is belonging. There is joy, there is life that awaits you. I said to him, verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fat and calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now listen, like I think we love this story. Like I think we love it. I mean, it's amazing. It's heartening. It's desirous, isn't it? I mean, 
If, if this is God, if this is how he moves towards, moves towards those who have offended him, who have shamed him, who have defied him, but come looking for forgiveness, if this is what he does, then that's amazing. Then that's life. Then that's exactly what we're looking for, to be fully known, fully known and loved. I mean, that's what we hope for. But, but the ones Jesus is telling this parable to, the Pharisees and the scribes, they would think this all irreverent. They would think this all dishonoring. That it would be scandalous because the father shamed his son. And he did because the son shamed himself. And he did. And they might understand the son's desperate attempt to work his way back. And they might even say, like, oh, good luck, try, see what happens. But they would never grant the sonship back. His choice is made. And then to see the father running, undignified. And then to see him come between the son and the law, which the law demanded the son's death for the disgrace that he brought to the father. To see him step in between that, that's unthinkable. That's unthinkable. And to see him filled with compassion, not seeking vindication, and to kiss him, never Never. But this is what the Father does because in this story, Jesus lays out before us the grace of God. He in Christ takes our shame on himself. He in Christ lowers himself. The glorious one steps down to become like us, fully human except in our sin so that he could stand between the law and us and suffer the penalty that is due to us. He in Christ is crushed for our sin, absorbs its cost so that we might be welcomed, you might be welcomed as sons and daughters of God. He in Christ clothes us with dignity and worth. The God would do that. Oh my goodness, I hope there is no streak of entitlement in you. I hope you never think I deserve any of that. And rather, I hope you see the massive grace of God and you come with thankfulness, with joy, with joy. The holy, perfect, sublime one giving himself over to shame and death so that you could live so that sinners could live. Now his older son, verse 25, was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, <laughs> son, <laughs> you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead in his life. He was lost and is found. Well, that's them, standing, listening, fuming, begrudging the generosity of God which they themselves need. And that's why you see the father in this story going out, right? Like he's going out to the older son just as he went out to the younger son and he's pleading with him. He's entreating him. Son, come in. Come in. You can hear like the, this, those last words. You can hear the compassion and tenderness 
filling his words as he's entreating him, pleading with him, come in. You see Jesus looking at those who would stand there with their hands folded over with disdain in their eyes, pleading with them, pleading with them. But they're angry. They're angry. He welcomes sinners. They are just like this older son. I served you. I served I obeyed you. I did everything you wanted me to do. And this son of yours deserves nothing. He deserves nothing. And I, that's the point, isn't it? None of us does. None of us does. But God, rich in grace towards sinners, offers himself, offers his kingdom, offers his life, offers his joy to those who would in vain try to merit it. He offers it to them freely. If they could only see that they need it. Now Jesus on purpose leaves the story unfinished, right? It's unfinished. So what does he do? Is he going to go in? Is he going to go away? Is he going to kill the father? Like, what's he going to do? And I guess the answer remains to be answered for all who hear and read these words. So let me draw out two truths that I hope you have already seen as we went through these parables. Here's the most magnificent reality. God in Christ came to seek and save the lost. This sounds so church-like, so common to us, but it is a magnificent reality. Because, I mean, and just imagine, like, just what is happening? This is, like, Jesus is standing. God incarnate is standing before those who despise him and pleads with them to come and taste grace. God taking on humanity, pleading with those who hate him. That is, that is incredible. That is unbelievable. The creator, sustainer, Lord of everything and everyone who owes nothing to no one, who needs nothing from anyone in Christ becomes like us so that he could die for us. The exalted one, the immortal one, tasting death so that sinners could live. That, that is massive. That is massive. Like we cannot miss this. We cannot miss this because we're all like sheep. We all have gone astray. We're all like that coin that is lost. We're all like that younger son who have defied God. We are all like the older son who would presume to merit his kindness by our lives. But he comes seeking, seeking, and treating to give us life on his own expense and calls us to come. Like, do you see the majesty of God in that? Like who does that? Who gives of his glory all the way to the point of death? Who does that? God does. For you. Like this shows us. This shows us the prodigious grace of God, but this shows us how deep our need is, that it would take the death of God for us to be clear of our guilt. And we think we can merit it somehow, that our good deeds, that our good life somehow will commend us to God. God in Christ came to seek and save the lost. For some of you, you know your sin very well. And you might be wondering if he even wants you. How he would go searching. He would turn the hives upside down. He would come running down just to offer you life. He rejoices over the one who repents. For some of you here, though, you've been, comparably speaking, good. Just upright, moral. You've been doing things and you are in need of grace all the same. Because you cannot commend yourself to God with your good life. Because the moment you seek to do so, pride comes out. Self-righteousness comes out. Self-seeking comes out. Look how great I am. And we defy the greatness of God with our own very lives. Our hearts betray us in that. We all need the grace of God, which he compassionately gives us to Christ. 
So that's the most magnificent reality, God seeking and saving the lost by covering for their sin. And out of that, Jesus stresses, as he stresses all throughout the parables, there is an urgency. There's an urgency. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Now, now here's what I mean by that. It is true. It is true that to see and taste the grace of God moves us to want Him, moves us to come to Him and say thank you. It moves, it changes us. It moves us to repentance. It, it shows us that we have been wrong, that we have defied the glorious one. We have gone against the good Father and He wants our good in our life, our very goodness. And so we come to Him in repentance. It changes us. Kindness changes us. There's no question. But, but, these parable have a, parables have a specific point of urgency. By them, Jesus is trying to show to the Pharisees and scribes their blindness. Right? They thought themselves as close with God, but in reality, they were far away from Him. Like, they would begrudge that grace. Like, how could we spend time with them? How could we rub shoulders with them? He should distance Himself from these people. He should call them out and stay away from them. And, and by all accounts, Jesus would call spade a spade. He called out the woman at the well. He called out Peter for some satanic thoughts. He called out his disciples' unbelief. He had no patience for unholiness, but he came precisely because we're all such. We're all such. And he shares these parables with the religious crowd around him to show them how deeply lost they are, how deeply in need of grace they are. Behind their outward righteousness stood a heart of ungrace and pride, filled with anger. The son is angry at grace. It's so unlike the heart of the one they claim to belong. He would rejoice over one who is bound. They would rather he judge them. And so he uses these parables to move them. He's seeking them in that. But here's what I want to press all that with you. You know, we like these parables for the way they magnificently spread the grace of God. I mean, who doesn't want to be found like the sheep? Who doesn't want to be found like that coin, searched for like that coin? Who doesn't want to be embraced like the Father? I mean, like the Son. I mean, come on, that's amazing. And so many of you have grabbed on that grace, have come to him and turned your life, and he's found you, and you love the grace in which you walk. But if we allow ourselves to put our hand on the pulse of what this text is saying, we will discover that we are constantly in danger of becoming like the older son. Because we have a good thing going on. Because it's a good crowd to hang out with. And we're in danger of being like the Pharisees, seeking retribution rather than restoration for sinners around us. Like that's so important because what marks us? What marks us as individuals? What marks us as a community of faith? Like, do you share in the compassion that he shows to the sinners? Do you share in earnestness that he has for those who need to find life? Do you share in joy over one who comes and trusts in him? And I think we'd love to be like, yes, of course. I mean, I want all my family to know Christ. I want my coworkers to know that. I want my neighbor and my kids. I want for people to know Jesus. And that would just rejoice your heart. But, but, what fills your heart when you see those who willfully stand against God? What fills your heart? When you see people reveling in ungodliness at pride marches, or hear God-defying voices pushing His presence ever to the margins of our society, or encounter those who would seek to gain on the death or exploitation of others, do you swell up in compassion for them or rather with condemnation? Do you desire for them to be found or forgotten? When you think of those who lead our nation further and further away from God's good designs, do you pray for them or do you pray against them? When you hear of those struggling with addictions, overdosing, does your heart break or do you relegate them to the choices they've made? 
What marks us? What marks our hearts when some celebrity or someone vile, even a society would portray them, or someone who actively ridiculed God comes to trust in Jesus? Do you rejoice in that or do you reserve your judgment for later? And look, that's not easy, right? That's not easy because our society, our culture is permeated with that which would demean God, glorify sin, and bring about of the ruin of life for everyone around us. It's just filled with that. We live in a day and age where ideologies that mean our downfall are celebrated and promoted, where distraction is life, of life is hailed as right or medical care, where to be unapologetically Christ for all to see is to step into an ever-growing opposition. There are movements that undermine all that is good and lovely and desirable. And we better not be silent. We better not withdraw from a public square. We better speak truth and life. But do you see the faces? Do you see the people who are lost, who are heading for Christless eternity? And do you rise up with compassion for them, seeking for the Father to find them? Do you see the faces? God's immense, undeserved, glorious kindness leads us to repentance over the posture in which we walk in this world. Over what marks us as individuals as community of faith. And listen, that's a good thing. That's a good thing because it's meant to bring us back to share in the joy of our Father. It's a good thing. It's meant to shape our hearts after His heart. It's meant to lead us towards sinners, towards the lost, so that they too might come and taste and see that the Lord is good, that they might find life, that they might see Christ who covers a multitude of sins, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He, by showing us his prodigious grace, <laughs> like, which we need daily, don't we daily need for God's grace to cover us? Don't we daily need to look back and remember, thank you that he died for me? Don't we daily need him to intercede for us? Don't we daily need the encouragement of his unfailing love? Don't we daily need to see this massive kindness? To see that, it leads us to reflect his desire for those who are lost. What grace that he would want sinners like us. Father, I thank you so much that by your Holy Spirit, as we come to see taste and rejoice in the grace you offer us. You shape us to resemble you in this world, to have the same kind of compassion, to have the same kind of earnestness, to have the same kind of resolve to go and seek, to go and tell of the news of life, of the grace that covers multitude of sins. Oh Lord, keep us from self-righteousness. Keep us from demeaning those who bear your image. Keep us close to yourself so that we might yearn for and then rejoice in salvation of those who do not know you yet. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.